Hey guys, this is Mike, the Detroit Borg, with a look at the new 24-inch iMac, which is the direct successor to the 21.5-inch Intel-based 4K iMac. And this is the first complete redesign of the iMac since 2012. That's almost a 10-year run, so this is long overdue, and there's a lot to talk about, especially in terms of design. But this design takes advantage of the new Apple Silicon architecture. So we get an extremely compact internal design, which freed the designers to significantly reduce the overall size and volume of the iMac while giving us a much larger screen. And this is sort of a return to the idea of the original iMac, which was a much more fun design available in lots of colors with an extreme attention to detail, which we'll get into. So getting to the unboxing of an iMac, it's been a while since unboxing an iMac was kind of a new experience because they haven't redesigned the iMac in 10 years. Now this time the packaging design is geared toward environmentally friendly materials. So everything is paper or biodegradable. So unlike previous iMac unboxings, you open this one flat on a table as opposed to vertical. If you open up vertical, basically the iMac will be upside down. So it's a little confusing at first. And the presentation here is pretty unique. So you have these arrows on either side of the box, which are incidentally also color coordinated to the iMac, which tell you to spread the box sides apart, which basically opens up the box for you and allows you to take the iMac out of its cradle. Below the iMac is all of the accessories. And this is where things will vary depending on the accessory configuration you went with. In my case, of course, I wanted to see everything that's available, so I got them all. I got the upgraded keyboard with the numeric keypad and both the trackpad and the mouse. The Magic Keyboard is a pretty familiar design, but it has been tweaked for this new iMac. So it includes a more rounded design at the corners, but also some new keys. One of them is a new Touch ID sensor, which replaces the eject button. That Touch ID sensor basically looks like it came off an older iPad, but it works exactly the same. They've also reassigned the functions on the F4 through F6 keys. So we get Spotlight Search, Dictation, and Do Not Disturb. Next up is the color coordinated Magic Trackpad, which has also been redesigned with more rounded corners to match the new keyboard. Otherwise, this works like every other Magic Trackpad we've seen before. This is a solid state device, so it replicates the sensation of a click, but doesn't have a mechanical click. So that means we get consistent clicking performance across the entire surface of the trackpad, not just at the bottom. And lastly is the Magic Mouse 2, which received no update besides the color. So this is the same design you either love or hate. So we get that multi-touch gesture service on the top, which also has a mechanical click, and the lightning port on the bottom, which means you cannot charge and use the mouse at the same time, which remains a very controversial sticking point for this design. But all of these devices recharge via a lightning port and they all have an on and off switch. And of course you have some detailed color coordination going on here, right down to the inserts for the lightning port and the plastic rails on the back of the Magic Mouse. And to think they have to do this with seven different iMacs. That's a big departure from the silver and black design we've had for over a decade. So that color coordination extends all the way to the cables themselves, including this new braided style lightning cable for recharging your accessories. Even the paperwork is color coordinated. In my case, it's blue, but that color coordination extends to the most important thing that comes out of this box, which is the two-toned Apple stickers to go with the two-toned finish of the iMac. Now that's attention to detail. Next up is something that's quite different for an iMac, and that's an external power supply. So this is a first for an iMac. Now the advantages of having an external power supply is that it keeps the heat out of the body of the iMac so there's less need for cooling. It also means that if the power supply fails, you don't have to take apart the entire iMac to fix it. One of the clever things about this 143 watt power supply is that it incorporates a gigabit ethernet port in the upgraded model. Now the integrated power cable is also braided for durability and color mats right down to the two-tone design, but this connector is a MagSafe style connector, another first for an iMac. And of course this connector is doing more than just supplying power, it's also passing data for the ethernet port. And again, I have to point out the fact that even the inside of this connector matches the color of the iMac. By the way, this power supply, at least if you get the one with the ethernet port, is a bit larger than the 96 watt power supply that comes with the 16 inch MacBook Pro. But thankfully this cable is long enough for the power supply to reach the floor, even if you have an extra tall desk. Moving on to the very well protected iMac, we have a few layers to get through before we can start using it. So we do have an envelope wrapping the iMac, which is very similar to previous iMacs. So again, this is sort of a paper material and you'll see that little recycle icon on the back. You just sort of have to pull these tabs in order to free it up 
and pull it off the iMac. But of course, we got more going on here. So we have this nice bright white screen protector, uh, which has the hello icon on the front, which is also part of the boot up sequence. Now we just have to peel this off in one sheet so you can see the tabs along the side to make this clean and easy. It is one sheet of glass with a sort of blue tint at the bottom edge to give it a little more style, but obviously no Apple logo this time. We also have a piece of plastic covering the aluminum back panel, which is also fairly easy to peel off. We also have a little piece of plastic just behind the stand that's covering the MagSafe power connector, I guess to prevent dust from collecting inside of it. And lastly, we have a single strip of plastic covering the entire rim of the iMac. So just one peel will pull it all the way off. Just make sure you don't knock over the iMac in the process. In terms of design, this iMac is definitely a big departure from the previous, but it does pick up a lot of familiar design cues, such as the chin along the bottom. It also resurrects some old design cues, such as the white bezel surrounding the screen, which we've seen on previous iMacs. Now this two-tone color is very important to the design of these iMacs. So when you look at the iMac front on, the keyboard, the mouse, the stand, and the chin are sort of color coordinated. When you flip it around, you'll see a two-tone effect with that dark blue on the back of the iMac. Now interesting enough, we do have a glossy Apple logo on the back, and that light blue matches the light blue on the chin, even though these two can never be seen at the same time. So when you pick your iMac color, perhaps the most important color you're gonna look at is what you see on the front. So although that deep blue color on the back is really striking and really nice looking, it is sort of a secondary color when you consider that it's likely facing the wall and you won't see it most of the time. In terms of IO, this is gonna be a pretty familiar story for Apple. Everything is USB Type-C slash Thunderbolt 3 slash USB 4. In this case, the standard iMac gets two Thunderbolt 3 slash USB 4 ports, which are good for 40 gigs per second. In the upgraded model, they add two additional USB Type-C ports, which are USB 3, which support up to 10 gigs per second. Now, because the iMac is so thin, then the 3.5 millimeter headphone jack has been relocated to the left edge of the iMac. And if you're looking closely, you'll see that even the USB Type-C connectors and the headphone jack have matching dark blue inserts. The new MagSafe power connector on the iMac does solve some problems that obviously come up with such a thin design. It's very low profile, but it's also very easy to connect. There's no alignment needed. It just basically snaps into place because the design is circular. So basically it's omnidirectional. You can basically just bring the plug right next to the connector and it snaps into place by itself. Now, Unlike the MagSafe connectors from MacBooks, which were designed to come off really easily, these are on there very securely, so they're not meant to be removed often. And obviously, you wouldn't do that on a desktop. Although the Apple logo isn't backlit, it does have a Wi-Fi antenna behind it, which does support Wi-Fi 6, and we also have Bluetooth 5.0. The new stand on this iMac adopts a design very similar to the Pro Display XDR. It's a much lower profile, both side to side and back to back, compared to the previous iMac. The hinge for the stand is also mounted externally as opposed to the previous design which was mounted internally. Again, that keeps this design very slim and minimal. Fortunately for this aluminum stand, we do have these rubber feet on the bottom edge which keep it nice and protected and also prevent it from sliding around on the table. And of course, it's also color matched. Unfortunately, the stand cannot be removed externally for a visa mount. You have to take apart the entire iMac to get to it. So if you want a visa mount, you'll have to order that when you order your iMac. And that basically applies to every part of this configuration. This this iMac is a fully integrated design, so you cannot upgrade any part of it after you've bought it. And as always, the power button is along the back, but it's concave, so it's easy to feel for. By far the biggest upgrade with this new design is the larger display. So we get a device that's roughly the same size as the 21.5 inch model, but we get a 24 inch screen. This is a 4.5K screen instead of 4K, and that's largely to achieve the same pixel density of 218 PPI, which is good for retina resolution on an iMac. But this is also a DC IP3 panel, which supports the wide color space. So this is a very nice, vibrant and colorful panel. It's not terribly bright at 500 nits, but that's also very consistent with other Mac models. But unlike the 4K iMac, this does get True Tone technology, which means this can adapt the color and white balance of the display to the ambient lighting conditions. In terms of glare and reflection, it does seem at first that with an all glass front panel, you would see more of it than the previous design. But overall, the anti-reflective properties are very similar. So there is some mitigation here, but it's not perfect. But the other benefit of this white bezel is that it limits how 
how much reflection you see in this glass panel. So you can kind of see why they did not give this an all black design because if it were, you probably see more reflection, especially in that chin. Now we've had a 24 inch iMac before, but if you compare them side by side, you can see there are some differences. And one of them is that the new 24 inch iMac is actually rounded up from 23.5 inches. And it's also a widescreen 16 by nine aspect ratio versus 16 by 10. So overall, this is a slightly smaller 24 inch screen than we've seen before. Naturally, they also had to color coordinate the display, and that comes down to both the screensaver and the wallpapers. So we get this really cool Hello screensaver, and you can change the color, although by default, it will be set to the color of the iMac you've purchased. So if you want orange on your blue iMac, you could certainly go for that. In terms of the wallpaper, we have both a dark and light wallpaper. And again, you can select the color you prefer. But again, by default, they've already matched it to your iMac. Another welcome and overdue improvement is the new 1080p FaceTime HD camera, replacing the 720p from last generation. But the big news here is the new image signal processor that's carried aboard the M1 chip. That's the same technology that came from the iPhone and the iPad, and it makes a huge difference. But we also get a huge microphone upgrade just behind the camera on the back of the iMac, you'll see two microphones at the top edge and one right behind it. Now Apple calls this studio grade microphones and although that's kind of a stretch, they are pretty impressive overall in terms of their performance. So let's go ahead and take a look and a listen to the difference. So here's an example of the built-in camera and the triple microphone setup, which does improve both audio and video quality quite a bit, although it's still a 1080p camera. And here is the truly outdated 21.5 inch 4K iMac camera, which definitely looks pretty fuzzy and dark. In terms of the chin design on this iMac, the interesting thing here is that it's more purposeful because the entire computer is located in that thin strip below the display. Everything lives there from the CPU to the RAM, to the storage, to the speakers, the IO, everything is in that space. That really wasn't the case before. So that chin on the previous iMac design was less integral than it is now. Now, if you look at the bottom edge of the iMac, you'll see a grill from edge to edge, which houses the speakers and the cooling for the CPU. So the cooling for the CPU is right in the middle. Now, if you really ramp up this computer, you will hear the fan running, although it's not as loud as the 4K iMac. That got perhaps four times as loud as this one does. Apple's audio engineers have produced some amazing audio on small devices in the past, and this is no exception on the new iMac. We actually have a six speaker design with force canceling subwoofers, which improve the performance of the subwoofers without distortion. But they've been able to work in Dolby Atmos and spatial audio, and the thing that really stands out about these speakers is just how immersive the audio is. It's very clear, well separated, so there's a nice distinction between the mid-range highs and lows, and it's quite a bit more immersive than the typical iMac speakers. Although we don't get the same low frequency punch that we see on something like the iMac Pro or the 27 inch iMac. Although it's not standard, this is the first iMac with a Touch ID sensor. And it's also the first Touch ID sensor that has a wireless connection to the computer. And in order to achieve this securely, they've incorporated a dedicated chip inside the keyboard, which is able to encrypt the data to the computer to make sure it stays secure. Now you can just lightly tap the Touch ID sensor to unlock and take you directly to the desktop, but you can also tap that key in order to lock the screen again. So the base configuration starts at 1299 and all versions get the Apple M1 chip, although the base configuration gets a seven core GPU instead of eight core GPU, just like the base configuration of the MacBook Air. But this is the same M1 chip in the MacBook Air, the MacBook Pro, the Mac Mini, and the new iPad Pros. 256 gigs of SSD storage is standard with eight gigs of unified RAM. You can upgrade to two terabytes of storage and 16 gigs of RAM. So the most you can spend is about $2,600 on this iMac. In terms of performance, there's no surprises here because this is the same chip that's in all of those other Macs and performance is pretty much equivalent to the Mac Mini, although I am getting slightly better results on the single core score. So this might place the iMac 24 inch at the top of the Mac range in terms of single core performance. Also a massive upgrade is the speed of the SSD, which actually smokes the hard disk drive in the old 4K iMac. What's a little confusing about this computer is that it seems like it's just a home desktop PC for the family, but in reality, this is an extremely capable and powerful computer that can edit multiple streams of 4K video, drive a 6K external display, 
and be able to edit 100 megapixel photographs with ease. Now for me, this computer is more than capable enough of replacing my iMac Pro in my daily workflow. The only drawback is the limits in terms of the IO. So though I can attach a bunch of dongles to the back of this computer and get what I need, it's still not as slick as having an integrated solution for an SD card slot or a standard USB-A port. So at $12.99 or $14.99, which is the configuration I would recommend, I think this is the best value in terms of the Mac lineup to date. But of course, this is only the first stage of the iMac redesign. We still have a bigger iMac on the way. I'm really looking forward to it. So it should come with even better processing power and hopefully more IO. Alrighty guys, hope you enjoyed this look at the 24 inch iMac. If you did, please give this video a thumbs up to let me know and I'll see you again in my next video.